All right, so for this next segment, we have also set aside some time to answer some commonly asked questions regarding men's health and urological problems. These questions are posed by some of you during the sign up. So for the first question, we'll go. I've already removed the prostate gland with stage two prostate cancer uh, in February, 2021. My problem is I still cannot control the outflow of urine. What would be your advice? Removal or radical prostatectomy is a, a form of treatment for prostate cancer which you have undergone. Okay, So uh, a lot of times what is not discussed uh, during the counseling process uh, when you're actually uh, planning for the treatment or surgery is that uh, the important aspects in terms of uh, functional uh, impediments, Okay, not just getting rid of the cancer. The, one of the implications obviously is because of prostate gland, when you actually remove the entire prostate gland, it is uh, very close to um, a pelvic floor. Uh, some of the muscles actually get injured um, through the process of removal of the prostate gland. Okay, no matter how good the surgeon is or how meticulous the surgeon is, uh, the other so there is, there will be some implication in terms of damage to the pelvic floor, which is important for supporting of the bladder uh, organ. Okay, so. When the pelvic floor itself is weakened or damaged, uh, uh, one of the consequences will be that of incontinence or urinary leakage. Okay, as uh, this usually happens when you have increased intra-abdominal pressure, when you cough, when you sneeze, for instance, or you stand up. Okay, um, um, and when your, your pelvic muscles are weak, uh, you can't hold the urine in, and the urine actually leaks out. The other common things that actually happen is uh, you, the nerve around the prostate may be damaged and resulting in the other functional impediment, which is erectile dysfunction. Uh, regards to coming back to your urinary control issues, okay, so uh, it is not uncommon. And the more aggressive the surgery is, that means uh, if the surgeon attempt to in, in the aim for curing your cancer, it takes a very wide margin the chances of damaging the, the pelvic floor muscles will be greater and it will be expected. And also, you also determine, also depending on your age, the older you are, the more likely your pelvic floor uh, will be more deficient or weaker. So, so the consequence of urinary control will be greater as well. A lot of times after the surgery, as part of the rehab program, um, uh, the doctors or urologists uh, will put you through, will be... Uh, would be some form of Kegel exercise or pelvic floor exercise to strengthen uh, the pelvic floor muscles to help uh, with the continence. Okay, but it is still um, not unusual for uh, a certain population, a certain uh, demographic to have these issues in continence up to about a year uh, post-surgery. But uh, in general, it does improve with uh, time. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for uh, such insightful answer for that. Okay, so for the next question, I went for robotics prostate biopsy in July 2017 as my PSA was 10.67. The results is that there's benign tissues, no evidence of malignancy. Hmm. After the biopsy, the PSA in November 2017 dropped to 6.27 and in December 2019, 5.48. However, in 20, December 2020, it rise up back to 6.28. Hmm. The question is, is it necessary to do a repeat biopsy test? So I put it this way, okay? So, so your lab, your prostate, robotic prostate biopsy, assume it is a very, very thorough biopsy whereby there is a very thorough sampling of the prostate gland, okay? So uh, since then, okay, your PSA level has actually dropped and, and it's actually leveling out off at level five or six. The typical cutoff we take uh, for the PSA to be normal is uh, anywhere in the region less than four. Okay, so it is still at a slightly uh, higher than acceptable level, all right? But um, the silver lining is that it's actually stable. It's actually uh, not higher. But I understand that there is still, there will, there will, there will always be a concern. Is there underlying cancer? Uh, is there something that, is there that was missed the first time. So one of the things that you can discuss or, or with your treating doctor is maybe uh, to, to do an additional uh, MRI imaging or multiparametric MRI scan of the prostate. Uh, uh, it is not as invasive as a biopsy, but it will help 
uh, if there's any lesions okay within the prostate uh, typically that will picked up okay if there's nothing that's picked up by the mri scan and then all is good we can continue surveillance um, of course if is picking up something uh, suspicious for instance uh, then there's a uh, more reason uh, to go ahead with a repeat biopsy uh, targeting all these lesions that is seen on the uh, mri scan all right thank you dr lee so for the third uh, pre-collated questions we have it's um i think one of the question was the types of treatment for an enlarged prostate mm -hmm. as well as the minimum invasive techniques available for okay. treatment of enlarged prostate okay prostate enlargement like i say is a quite a common thing with uh, that that the urologists see the the standard treatment or traditional treatment has always been either a uh, medical treatment okay or a procedure called transurethral resection of prostate. Okay, medical treatment works by um, relaxing the lining uh, of the uh, within the prostate to ease the flow, or through means of uh, shrinking the prostate. Okay, the downside obviously, uh, some people just don't like long term medication because you you once you start and it's working, you need to be continue on it. If not, uh, the prostate will grow back and cause problem and. Uh, long-term medication uh, other than cause uh, there are issues with sexual dysfunction uh, is the, uh, the, the medication is known to result in a drop in sex drive uh, erectile dysfunction and uh, causes ejaculatory problem okay but um, traditional transurethral resection of prostate okay is a more very efficient and very standard way of treating prostate enlargement what we do is actually put instrument through the penis actually scrape away uh, the prostate that is actually protruding or, or intruding into the lumen okay uh, to to excavate it down uh, so say this requires hospitalization for two to three days uh, and then uh, you're all good right okay but more and more so now what is new uh, that has come on stream over the past uh, one to two years uh, minimally invasive technique more minimally invasive techniques that can be done as day surgery uh, um, and also touted to have less sexual uh, side effects so things like um, using water vapor therapy injecting in the prostate uh, to cause damage to the tissues okay so this is called resume therapy the treatment uh, called uro leaf therapy whereby uh, using implants uh, we pull the prostate leaves apart to open up the channel Again, it is a, a day procedure can be done within five to 10 minutes. Okay, again, touted to have very little sexual side effect. And the third is something called a pro leaf therapy. Uh, this is a thermal dilatation uh, using a balloon to splint the prostate apart and then uh, applying microwave therapy to uh, the melt some of the prostate tissues away. So, so exciting times, uh, many, many uh, treatments available, uh, what is suitable for you uh, may vary and depending on your prostate size, um, the configuration as well as is uh, what you uh, hope to achieve from the treatment. Are you on the panel of any integrated shield plan providers? And if so, which ones? Okay, there are seven integrated shield plans. I'm on six of them. So I'm on Great Eastern, uh, Prudential, NTUC, uh, AXA, Aviva, and Raffles Health. Yeah. All right. So for the next question we'll have, uh, one of the uh, attendees actually asked is, which is more accurate to determine whether I have prostate cancer or not? Will it be via an, an MRI or via a biopsy? Okay. So the typical scenario is you have a PSA done and it's shown that, you know, your level of PSA is elevated. So you are higher risk. The suspicion is that you may have cancer. Okay. Um, to determine whether you have cancer, the, the, the gold standard is actually a biopsy. But a lot of times, okay, biopsy is invasive and a lot of people, uh, me included, uh, may be averse to it. Okay, so this is where the MRI or multiple MRI comes into play. Okay, so, so in a lot of workflow now, okay, upon um, detecting that or elevated PSA, we move on to actually having a multi-parametric uh, uh, MRI scan done, okay, to image 
the prostate gland uh, thoroughly. Okay, so if the MRI shows that there is a suspicious lesion, anything dangerous or looking like cancer, that's when we move on to do a biopsy. Okay, to confirm and to determine whether, for one, whether it is indeed this suspicious lesion that's seen on the MRI scan is it a cancerous lesion, and if it is, how aggressive, what kind of grade it is. Okay, that will help. Uh, determine uh, what kind of treatment is best for you. But if the MRI scan shows that it is negative, nothing dangerous, then you know the elevated PSA may be a false, uh, uh, a false, false elevation. Okay, other prostate condition that may cause elevated PSA may include enlarged prostate or prostate inflammation or, or infection. All right, thank you, Dr. Lee. So for the next question, I think there's a couple of questions on uh, to test the right. So uh, maybe I will just bring both of them together lah, so you can answer two, two questions at one. So um, one of the questions is whether taking this to test the right, the, the medication for BPH, can this uh, actually cause cancer? And uh, the question that we have about to test the right is whether uh, can this, this medication be taken every other day instead of daily to reduce this risk of getting the cancer due to the test the right? So there's some of the attendees actually may have read some reports that the testosterone may actually cause prostate cancer. So what's your take on this, Dr. Lee? Okay, so to testosterone and uh, the other drug called finasteride, there are classes of drug, uh, um, we call 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. So these are medication, uh, the typical indication is to help uh, treat prostate enlargement and over time they will shrink the prostate gland down. And, and provide relief, okay. Um, interesting, okay, uh, fact is that, you know, uh, the studies that has been done on this classes of medication, uh, it's been shown that, you know, it, it is useful in chemo prevention. So that, it, in other words, it's used upon prolonged taking or long durations of taking it, it reduces the chance of you getting prostate cancer, okay, but, uh, what is uh, 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 what is always in the news is that you know those what they found is that those people that uh, uh, on some of this therapy when they actually uh, do a biopsy, okay, they find that you know their tendency towards a higher grade, a more aggressive prostate cancer. Okay, that may be uh, there may be some confounding factors there. Okay, why? Uh, one of the reasons, obviously, is because uh, with uh, the continued taking of this medication, the prostate actually shrinks uh, to the point whereby uh, a lot of times when you do a biopsy, then uh, uh, compared to another guy whose prostate is actually large, uh, the chances of actually finding a, a cancer tends to be a little bit higher. Okay, but but um, um, if you not not true, like, basically, if you if you. Uh, you, to answer the question, uh, it's not true that, you know, it, it, it prolonged taking of this medication actually causes prostate cancer. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I think that's very relieving to hear. So for the next question that uh, we will have is, how common is BPH and what are the likely causes? Okay. Also, is mm -hmm. there any correlation between BPH and the chances of uh, getting a prostate cancer? Uh, BPH is actually very common. You look at the graph earlier on, okay, um, what, we, what I generally tell the patient is that uh, BPH typically occurs from the age of 40s, okay, so by the, age, by the time you reach about 50s, uh, half the male population will have some degree of prostate enlargement or BPH. By the time you're about 80, 90% uh, of the male population will uh, have some evidence of BPH. So, so uh, it rises with age. Um, the second bit, or you're asking, what was that again? Whether there's any correlation between BPH and uh, prostate cancer. Prostate cancer, okay. Yeah. So uh, again, very common question. No, the short answer is no, no correlation. Please, prostate enlargement do not cause prostate cancer. Okay, but what is, has been found is that, you know, uh, people with prostate, it's not unusual for patients, okay, seeing doctors for prostate enlargement issues are found with prostate cancer. Uh, number one, one of the reasons is of course, uh, prostate cancer and prostate enlargement are both very common uh, conditions, okay? And number two, obviously, a patient with prostate enlargement is more likely, uh, if you're seeing a doctor, more likely 
uh, if you are, you are a very careful doctor to do checks on the prostate and the chances of actually picking up uh, other conditions of prostate like cancers uh, tend to be a bit higher. All right, thank you, Dr. Lee. All right, so next question that we have over here is whether uh, another attendee has asked whether over-exercising can result in a low libido. Uh, yeah, so the, this attendee actually visits the gym about four mm -hmm. to six days a week, uh, about 60 to 90 minutes per, per session. So the worry is whether can over-exercising result in low libido? Uh, 60 to 90 minutes, depending on how strenuous your, 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 your the session is, uh, you may get tired out, you may get fatigued, but uh, typically, it, there's, there's no impact on libido, okay? Um, uh, it's been found that, you know, regular exercise in moderate amount actually helps uh, boost uh, the body's natural production of testosterone. So, so actually the opposite. Mm. It's good to exercise. Not, not over-exercise, though, yeah. Right, I think that's also very relieving to hear. All right, so the next question that we have, what are some of uh, lifestyle reasons that contributes to increased number of prostate cancer in recent years? And also the second part will be, are there any preventive measures to minimize this? The, the most definite cause, okay, why prostate uh, for, for a risk factor for prostate cancer is age. Uh, of course, uh, the older you are, you, the more likely to, to get prostate cancer. So those you can't change together with ethnicity, you're born into the ethnic group that you are, as well as family history, right? So th those, those are uh, uh, things that you, you, you cannot alter. But, but what, um, what uh, some of the studies have shown in terms of correlation is that uh, some, some, some lifestyle habits, uh, uh, if over long duration, uh, Decades, for instance, uh, if you take a lot of processed uh, meat, uh, high-fat diet, uh, compared to somebody who's leaning more towards uh, leafy vegetables, fruits, like diet, uh, the tendency to develop prostate cancer is a little bit higher. Uh, that's probably the, the one of the uh, more, more common things we see. Uh, obesity uh, is another lifestyle conditions that uh, have some correlation uh, as well as smoking. Smoking is shown, uh, there's some study that shows that smokers, uh, if they're diagnosed with prostate cancer, they tend to be a more aggressive form. Right, thank you, Dr. Lee. Okay, so we have another question. What are the implications of removing the prostate? Okay. So uh, the, the function of the prostate is one of reproduction, okay? Having it removed, it means that, you know, the reproductive tract has been, has been disrupted, means that you can't make babies anymore. So, so that's number one. Okay, so the other thing will be that once the reproductive tract has been disrupted, okay, you'll find that there will be no more ejaculation, right? So there will be no semen expulsion, okay? Uh, uh, other than that, okay, the rest are functional in nature, okay? Having the prostate removed, the process of removing the prostate tends to have implication in terms of damage or, or injury to the surrounding structure. The nerves that runs around the prostate we talk of, okay? Uh, once, if they, those are damaged, they can result in eject, uh, erection issues, so erectile dysfunction. Uh, the pelvic floor muscles uh, that supports the prostate gland, if they are stretched or injured, uh, you have problem with uh, continence issues, leakage of urine. All right, thank you, Dr. Lee. I think there's a question on Facebook Live as well. Uh, so the question is, I've been on prostate enlargement medication for almost a year, but my symptoms haven't improved much. Is, do I need to be on medications for long term or are there other more permanent solutions for him? Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, if you find that, you know, you've been on medication for a year and there's no dramatic improvement, uh, one of the reasons may be... Uh, that your medication has not been optimized. Okay, so, so there are a few classes of medication that we typically will use to help uh, treat prostate enlargement. Okay, so there's a class of medication that relaxes the lining to ease the flow. Okay, and the other, another class that will help over time to string the prostate. Okay, so if uh, you're on the class of medication that actually just relieve the passage and not string the prostate, okay, what will happen over time is that your prostate will continue to grow. And as it grows, uh, 
uh, you'll find that your symptoms uh, will, will not improve. Okay, all right. So uh, other reasons may be, you know, just the configuration of prostate is such that, you know, um, the medication don't work well. Okay, so uh, then the consideration is whether you're suitable or you're ready uh, to, to move on to uh, consider a more invasive form of treatment to, um, to help relieve some of your symptoms and give you a better quality of life. Uh, attendee would like to ask, uh, Dr. Lee, is surgery an option for prostate? Uh, so I'm 65 years old and was told that I have a slight and large prostate and frequent urinating, especially during sleeping time. Yeah, so whether surgery is an option for this patient. Mm -hmm. So um, so your the, the, the symptoms again? Uh, slightly enlarged uh -huh. prostate with uh, uh -huh. frequent urinating, especially uh, night urination. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so if frequent urination at night, okay, so, so it, it depends on what is the reason for the frequent urination at night, okay. Uh, so at your age, it's not uncommon to have prostate enlargement, okay, but if the prostate enlargement, uh, how prostate enlargement occasionally cause uh, frequent urination at night is if uh, you have problem emptying the bladder, so much so that, you know, there's perpetual, uh, a, a small amount of urine within the bladder, uh, meaning that, you know, before long, it's filled up again, the bladder is full again, and you have to go. And in those scenarios, those situations, uh, then relieving the prostate obstruction uh, will help you empty better and actually gives you uh, a longer interval between voids. And you, 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 you will find that, you know, you actually will sleep uh, a lot better. Okay. But if the reason why uh, the frequent urination, why you're having frequent urination is a bladder issue, that means uh, the bladder capacity is limited. It doesn't hold a lot of uh, urine to start off with. Okay. Uh, that's why you're going quite frequently and actually small volume small amount or if the reason is because you drink a lot of water in the evening or, or your kidney or your body is such that you know you expel most of the uh, excess water only in the evening then treating the prostate uh, is not going to give you a relief so so um, i think uh, you it's necessary for you to actually have a proper evaluation by a doctor determining uh, what's the cause for the frequent urination before embarking on something invasive like a, a prostate surgery yeah right thank you dr lee so uh, uh the point about invasive surgery so uh, one, another attendee has been asking so what's a better procedure uh is terp uh, or green light laser a better procedure mm -hmm. both procedures are pretty established in terms uh, in, in 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 terms of treatment for prostate enlargement uh, trp or terp has been around for uh, a long time and the evidence is actually more established and long-standing. The advantage of a green light uh, over a TERP is uh, typically in cases whereby we're talking about patients uh, who are on blood thinners, uh, blood thinning medicine uh, up for heart conditions and those, con those medication cannot be stopped uh, for any duration during operation, during the window of operation. That's when actually green light actually works very well. Uh, um, uh, we have used green light uh, to treat patients with prostate enlargement issues so bad that they actually uh, they couldn't pee, they're on the catheter. And the green light actually melts the prostate away and results in relief. Um, uh, it helps in those situations whereby you know, bleeding risk is higher, uh, tends to be higher, but of course, uh, in terms of cost comparison, the green light tends to be a bit more expensive from, compared to a third. Yeah. So for the last question that we have for tonight, uh, Dr. Lee, it will just, it's going to be, how can we maintain good prostate health? Something that I think will be general, generalizable for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think there is any good uh, strategies to uh, improve, no known good strategies to improve prostate health. I think uh, in terms of prostate enlargement, prostate cancers, very, very, the things that you can alter is actually pretty limited. But, but in general, anything um, that uh, in terms of diet wise, uh, that will improve your cardiovascular health. So avoiding alcohol, 
our cigarettes, uh, clean living, clean eating, uh, regular exercise in general that improve your overall health. Uh, anything like that will, will improve your uh, 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 overall prostate health as well. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe for your regular dose of Asian health information.